Welcome back, everybody. I'm Sean LaFlock. I'm here with Scotty Hagnes. This is Conversations Fitness, Wellness, and Longevity. Scott, how goes it? It's going good. How are you? Not bad. Is your summer as good as my summer right now in terms of the weather? <laughs> is it beastly <laughs> up there? better. Um, actually, no. It's really pleasant. Probably not quite 80 outside. Pretty comfortable. Well, myself and the rest of America are going through a bit of a heat wave. That being said, this is normal weather for June. It's like, you know, 88 to 90 degrees with about 70% humidity uh, today. So, uh, yeah, you got that, that going for terrible. us, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Pretty comfortable here. It's been fairly mild. Is it okay to ride in that uh, kind of heat there, Scott, or is it just unbearable, like when it's hot? Um, if it's dry, I, I really enjoy it. When I was in Arizona really. a few weeks ago, I was riding in like at high noon and it was 90 something and uh, it was fine. Does just, riding uh, in, little... does, does riding in heat change the, anything about riding in general? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, uh, heart rate is definitely higher. Energy demand is definitely higher. Like it, it feels like a significantly harder workout just from a training perspective. Whereas yep. on a cool day, like it barely, sometimes it barely feels like you, you know, approach Z1, but you can feel like you're about threshold in the heat. So yeah, yeah it definitely changes it. And uh, you go through a lot of water. Oh, yeah. It's interesting because uh, we, we retested Fran within the classes today. And the last time that we tested it, because I try, I try to do it like a six-month block where we retest some of the stuff. And um, mm-hmm. people were just melting today in the gym. So I, I, I oh, have to kind of reassess what I, what I want to do. That being said, we had some people PR and that kind of stuff. But, you know, um, I know that you've been – do you still program for the classes, Scott? Or do you, does uh, one of your coaches program for it? Uh, one of our coaches does most of it. I do a little bit of the some of the fun stuff for the weekend, but just that. That's yeah. Um, do you guys go on a progressive plan still? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty pretty structured, pretty planned out. Um, how did you uh, come about that, Scott? And how long have you been doing that for your for your gym? Oh boy, that is a good question. Uh, when did we start? I feel like it was probably as far ago as two thousand eight. Mm. That we started at least with some, maybe you know, it was definitely more randomized, but it was definitely had structure. And then I would say by 2010, it was probably definitely in kind of set cycles. And we've used many different approaches over all those years, but it's always had some sort of continuity to it. Yeah. And what have you found in those 10 years, some of the uh, better training protocols and, and systems or just overall concepts uh, that have kind of like, wow, like, holy crap, over a six-week, eight-week, 12-week plan, this definitely was, would be something that I would bring not only to other classes, but also to my own uh, training and, and, and those clients that I train. Uh, you're talking like, you know, learnings from things we tried and worked really well or just what I've found? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's good. Um, you can go into actual training protocols, but also general concept as well, like, well, oh, we did this, and yeah, this was yeah. oh wow, this this went out of the park. Just like focusing on this aspect of training versus you know other aspects of training, or like I said, specific training protocols. Well, this you know linear progression worked well. This this uh, periodized that yeah. uh, that worked well. What what are some of the things that you found there, Scott? Uh, simplicity generally is king. I mean, we definitely don't use anything too complicated, and the the key is really. That I think really helped was when we figured a way out to get regular exposure to the elements that we were wanting to uh, train and be good at. So, you know, the system we implemented a number of years ago is actually, man, maybe, and maybe we had periods of it even long ago. I don't remember anymore, but the idea of if you missed a priority workout, you do it the next day. It takes precedence over whatever ah. that day's training is. So, we, and that way we hope to get you know, capture most of the people for whatever the most important workouts are. Got it. Now let me ask and you I'm, this. I'm, I'm, ahead, I'm walking out here just, you know, so there's a little bit of a, so you a can echo. see this maybe. Yeah. Oh, um, you got the, the board up there. I'm going to turn. I don't know how visible this is going to be. But... No worries. So Scott right now is showing me uh, the board of, for I guess this is for the week, correct? Or is this the day? This is actually potentially the day. Now it's, as we're recording, this is the 6th of July and the 4th of July fell on Wednesday, Yep, which made it a weird week. So there's a little more up there than would normally be. Yep. Um, our, our Wednesday strength priority workout didn't come out until Thursday. Got so it's it. still kicking up there today. And that's the, kind of the number one priority. 
Yep. And then there's a conditioning workout, which is designed either for a recovery or a training effect, depending on how you approach it and what, mm-hmm. fo- what folks need. And that was very simplistic. It, you know, doesn't take a lot of the coach's time. And then there's a gymnastic oriented one up there. That's technically today's main training. Uh-huh. However, uh, you guys still do regular class times though, right, Scott? Yeah. So what's going to happen is the warm up, the, the, the basic warm up is going to be the same. And it's, we keep our warm up pretty standard. And this is another thing we've really found. It kind of goes back into that consistency is that we put various mobility and, and joint prep stuff in the warm ups, and it's always there. So people that come in get very used to doing them properly. We can actually hit the nuances of them because we're not introducing new things all the time. And so we have most people that can do a single arm scat pull up in warm ups, for example, because it's always there. Wow. 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 And, and so um, that consistency, I mean, if you come in, like you'll see most people can do really deep Cossack squats, uh, things that are not normal, but that's because they're in the warm up all the time and people get good at them eventually. So a couple of things just to kind of highlight uh, that we've talked about already that I would definitely take home to the bank would be one, uh, making sure that potentially there is the ability to hit priority workouts regardless if you're there the day it is prescribed or not correct yeah uh-huh. so like say monday okay this is our priority uh the priority for monday is uh is, is getting your back squats in three by three at 80 percent or something like that mm-hmm. you're not there on monday the next day you would write down in terms of what the priority for that day is okay you're doing we're going to be doing gymnastics work but if you weren't there on monday you're going to be doing your back squats and uh, as a Uh, instead of or in supplement to? Generally instead of. Now, with that said, we don't, uh, you know, absolutely mandate, you know, if you're here, you have to do this, right? We, you know, but what we find is nearly everybody is bought into this idea of hitting the various priority things. Yep. And so, you know, it's generally just a complete non-issue. You know, people know they missed that. They want to do that. Uh, the, The supplementary work always provides a conditioning stimulus anyway. So it's not like you're not getting your work on, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the there's always the that feeling of like, wow, okay, I, I, got, I got some work in today, regardless yeah. if you made it or not to that first part. Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And there's certain folks that, for example, love gymnastic work and want to get better and will often have fairly difficult or complicated stuff as the scale up. So there's something that can, you know, something there for folks to do, but there's always much simpler versions that are approachable to, to anyone. Very cool. Um, but, the, you know, the one way, the thing that really cemented me on this, I have to believe I probably mentioned this at some point in our discussions. It was just, it was I had probably 2008 or nine, just based on where the gym was at the time. And we had decided to do a Wendler squat cycle. Uh, just the Wendler, the other stuff was kind of left to be random. And, and uh, at the time I was writing the programming and I decided, well, to try and capture the most people, I would basically vary what day that we did the these Wendler squats. Right? Got it. Got it. Got so it. it could appear any day from Monday to Friday. And I randomized it. And I remember I was teaching a class and we were, it was Wendler squat day and we were deep in the cycle, like six or seven weeks in maybe. And this one guy who'd been coming regularly the whole time, he looks kind of surprised. He's like back squats. He's, Man, we haven't done back squats for a long time. And oh, I thought shit. he was just joking, you know, and everyone just stopped and looked at him like, what the, and he was dead serious. He had missed this randomly <laughs> like <laughs> six weeks of back squats. <laughs> That's and I was incredible. like, well, this system kind of sucks. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. So basically you took that as a learning experience and said, wait a second. If, the, if people are falling through the cracks, so to speak, there has to be another way of going about this. Yeah. Yeah. That was really uh, kind of the, the tipping point. I was searching for a way before that, but uh, that was kind of the thing. I was like, all right. <laughs> so you know, this, this is obviously an outlier situation, but some version of it is going to happen all the time. Right? Yeah. So, uh, can you explain how you implemented those changes, Scott? Uh, the first thing we did there is that was the beginning of this idea of the priority day. I think initially it was literally just say the squats from then on out, you know, you miss them. And I think we'd hold it over all week because it was that one thing. So like it could have been on Monday, but if you came in Thursday and you still hadn't done it, I mean, you find a way to get that in and drop some other element or whatever that day's training was, um, which sort of worked for a while, but our, our present system is pretty solid, I think. And it takes a while, you know, when, you know, you, 
if it was just suddenly implemented, I think it would be a big change for a lot of people, but it's been implemented in stages over the years and everybody is uh, quite used to it and seen the benefit from it. So it's, uh, if you have a new person coming in, Scott, and, 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 you know, maybe they have CrossFitter before, maybe they're relatively new. Let's, let's go with a CrossFit person who's CrossFitter before. Mm-hmm. What's the spiel that you give to them uh, for them yeah. to understand the benefit of the way that you guys do it? Because, hey, hey, man, like, you know, usually we, we, we kind of randomize it a little bit. And, uh, you know, why, why would you want to do it like this? It's kind of against CrossFit, yeah. so to speak. To some degree, yeah, for sure. And uh, we're, dip- we're always super upfront telling people kind of, how we program and one thing we do is we put up all seven days of our wads on sunday night so you can mm-hmm. see the full week because we have so many people that participate in various sports you know i wanted to let people know if they're going rock climbing on saturday don't come in for the pull-up fest on friday yeah. you know or whatever and so uh, we kind of laid out explain all these things fall on these days there's randomized stuff here but there's these regular things the weekends is where you're going to see like straight up testers and but potentially also group workouts and more, you know, competitive base settings. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not for everybody, but we have a lot of our, you know, there's certainly a definitely a percentage of our new members are people that have moved to town. You know, Portland is growing faster than almost city, any yeah. city in the U.S. So <laughs> there is a pretty fairly endless stream of folks that have trained elsewhere coming in. Yep. And, and some people really, you know, they love it. It's like, oh, you know. I know this on stuff that they hadn't made progress on for a long time. And, and I think just the regular consistent focus on various things. Yep. And if they're new to, to CrossFit, it's pretty much like, Oh, well, this is what CrossFit is. <laughs> yeah. So lots of people, I mean, and you probably see this nowadays that the, you know, the, this true newbies, they know a little about it, but they don't know. They're not coming in with knowing all the acronyms. They've done it in their garage for yeah. a while and, you know, understand all the, it's, it just, they don't know that this isn't where it is, how it is everywhere. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this, Scott. Um, you know, since implementing these changes uh, have, and obviously the economy is changing as, it, you know, over the years as well. Um, have you changed your prices in your gym over the years? Uh, yeah, to some degree, for sure. Um, there was a time um, that we kind of, uh, structured ourselves to be that we had the we're the most expensive place in town. Mm-hmm. Um, what years would have those been? The early years we were in this location, basically. So 2011, 12, 13, maybe in, in that range. Mm-hmm. But you know, as the market became so saturated and competitive, we, you know, their prices have definitely come down. I mean, we're still a little on the higher end of some, but mm-hmm. not much. I mean, honestly within a few dollars, it's not, not any different than it was in 2007 or eight. You know? Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, in my perception, it, it kind of sucks to be honest with you Yeah. because this really isn't, it's not being driven by the market. The price isn't really being driven by your, your value. It's being driven by the fact that most people don't want to do the due diligence enough. You know what I mean? To, to actually see what the product difference is because you can't, it's not like you're looking at the, the uh, a Mercedes and a Mazda. You're not right. looking at that. It's like, well, uh, the results are going to be within year, two years, five years. Like, that's not going to sell me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you were to say, like, yo, in six weeks, you're going to change your body. And if you go somewhere else, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's it's, so it's many. super, it's, super it's, challenging to be able to. Because, I mean, I, that was the whole idea from the beginning with people, like, um, or, or, or not in many people, but like the once, cause we kind of come from same, uh, circles in terms of training and that kind of stuff in that, you know, we're like, Hey man, if you, if you are better at coaching, you should be charging more. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought of the same thing because we changed, we, we changed our prices back in like 2011, 2012. And, you know, we, I mean, like we have a bit of competition within the area, but you know, people were are undercutting, so to speak. But it's very mm-hmm. hard to show the value of your business y- y- with this type of business. Yeah, it really is, especially unless someone is really knowledgeable already, and that's yeah. just that's a you know, doesn't apply to hardly anybody. Yeah, and then you know the thing that sucks, especially out here, is with you know the the, the growth and the increase in lease rates and everything is tremendous. Yeah, the overhead is far greater than it was back in the day, but, but yet we can't really charge any you know anything 
um, to offset it. Yeah. You know, so that's that, the absolute does. truth. And that sucks because 10 years ago, the price, the, the value of a dollar is not what it is now, but we really can't change the prices. Right. Yeah. I think it's still remarkable how it's pretty much fixed right around what Greg Glassman charged in 2000. Uh, two or three, you know, in Santa I, Cruz. Yeah, I wonder what his thoughts on that would be. Uh, yeah, that it has that it has not gone up at all. If not, if not gone down, just because there's so many places you can do it. You know, yeah, watch some videos and go do it at various, you know, Globo Gym or you know, there's a rock climbing gym a few blocks from here that has a functional fitness area that has almost everything you would need to do CrossFit. Yep. Um, yeah, and then and then it's just the this location, you know. I mean, I. Another little story I may have related or not is where I ride my bike is about seven minutes from here in a parking lot at a church. And there's a guy that lived, a guy and his wife lived next door. And I talked to him fairly often. He's a friendly guy. And at some point, he he's like, he knew I owned a gym, but he came out one day. He's like, is that gym you own over here? here? And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's mine. It's like, oh, wow, I actually worked out at your gym before. We had done a Fit Mob, I think it was at one point, which is where, you know, you can there's a, you know, a part of service. You can buy passes to try out lots of different facilities. Uh-huh. And so he had come in on that, apparently. And he's like, yeah, we tried all these places. And yours was by far the best, like, knowledgeable and awesome facility, blah, blah, blah. And then he's kind of, like, kind of looked a little sheepish. And he says, yeah, but my wife and I go to this CrossFit that's just a couple blocks from here because we can just walk down there. And you know, it's like he's only seven minutes away, but there's a nearer one. And the, just the convenience of that outweighed, even though, you know, he recognizes the value in the, the product. Yeah. I, I, I think that's what it is, though. I think that people value convenience over the, the quality of a product. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, people are more willing to go to McDonald's because it's down the block from them than go two more blocks to a Whole Foods. Like, that's legit. Yeah. Yep, yep. I see that. You know, you see what, like, say, coffee shops around here, too. Like, yeah. There's, there's a nearby coffee shop. You know, they like the coffee, but you go there because it's so damn close. But there's a great one, but it's a few extra blocks. Well, I don't have that <laughs> We don't have the time, you know, so, yeah. Well, Scott, now that we're sitting here and, um, you know, maybe this is an opportunity to brainstorm. It's like, how do you, well, let me pose it another way. Why do you, because I think how is, is too like, all right, let's, let's think about the nuts and the bolts, but why, why is it important to show people that you're better or that your product is different? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the um, it's certainly important. I mean, maybe it isn't necessarily the end all be all that we would, you know, make it out to be and uh, let the product once they're there speak for itself a little bit. But um, you know what? Also, Scott, something that I thought of: how many of those CrossFits have been around since two thousand? How long have you been? Uh, two thousand six at this location, or you moved once? Uh, we've had two moves through the years. We've yes, been one from the original open karate since studio. early 05, yeah. 05 to 08, early 08 in the karate studio, 08 to early 2011 in our second spot, and then 2011 on here. All right, so let me ask you this. Since 2011 to now 2018, how many gyms have closed down around you? Oh, yeah, quite a few. I mean, I don't even... I don't even know all so a lot. maybe that's the key. Maybe it's you're not going to see that short term profit of okay we can, we can increase the twenty dollars you know uh, twenty bucks a month and continue to get people in. Maybe it is keeping it at this level until the war is over and then you go okay there's no other CrossFits now we actually can increase the price mm-hmm. because we're the only game in town or we're only game within the area. So now you're this is the right. convenient one and this is the one that you're going to be paying for. Right, yeah, your net it net increases. Yeah, there's that's and that's one thing I always kind of thought is you know weather the storm and things are gonna are gonna change at some point because it's so new still. I mean, there's still people who don't know really what CrossFit is. Is it more than 2010? Absolutely. I think CrossFit yeah. is, is is now like it's no longer a cult cult following. It's it's mainstream. Right. Yeah, it is definitely and. You know, I would say a minority of people that do it or have done it fall into the you know the stereotypical. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, they're mostly just average people all over the place that have done it. Yep. Or do it. My yeah. buddy actually sent me a picture of uh, uh, a CrossFit in New York City, and they're three fifty a month. 
Uh, yeah. $350 a month. You know what? Even just saying that, Scott, what you could do is go to all the CrossFits in the area and be like, listen, guys, this is what I charge. I think all of us can make some more money if we all charge similar rates. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yeah. we actually, instead of, instead of trying to, you know, undercut everybody, we all, you know, if, if you guys really think this is a better gym, then let's all charge the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if you could get everybody on board with that, that would be, uh... but that <laughs> but makes... there, as there's fewer as in fewer, you know, the yeah. quality ones kind of remain. I think that's, that, I think that's what that becomes, happen. uh, becomes something. Yeah. I mean, a I little bit of a conversation the plan. around these same things with kind of the other the other, you know, big established CrossFit is uh, X Factor, you know, that's uh, in the area. A um, um, couple months ago, maybe, whenever that, that uh, dinner with uh, Coach Glassman uh-huh. was in town. And, uh, yeah, kind of similar, similar thread, you know, just kind of brainstorming a little bit. But... Yep. Uh, it's definitely something interesting, interesting and something to, um, you know, reevaluate and uh, look at every so often, you know, every six months or so, just to kind of see what the current flavor and the current feel of what not only the perception of CrossFit is, but what people are willing to actually pay for it. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. now that more information is out there, now that the, 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 the fad phase is over, and now you're kind of left with the, the real essence of what's going on. Right. Yeah. Now it, things are in a real setting now and not, uh, not as before, you know, where it was just kind of booming uncontrollably. Exactly. Now that the Tickle Me Elmo phase is over and they're actually into like the, the long term, more like uh, like magic cards. Remember that game magic? Oh, yeah. I keep seeing I still see it in, in the toy stores and stuff like that. I'm like, OK, I guess this is still I, people still buy these. But I'm just saying, like in the beginning, like Pokemon or Tamagotchi or Elmo or magic there's this huge flood, but then it's like, all right, what happens after that? Like, I don't think that's, uh, most of the, you know, undercutting low price places. I just don't see how they can survive. Right. Yeah. It, it works as a short term strategy, I'm sure, but I, I don't see how that goes long term, you know, especially as there's, you know, limited, limited pool of folks over time and, and that you're not charging enough to, you know, barely pay yourself and keep the lights on. So exactly. So now what, you know, <laughs> um, I know this is probably like a, uh, interesting question and obviously approach in any way you want. What's the biz- biggest reason for people leaving your gym? Moving. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I always bummed that the you know, thing is about Portland, it is a rather transient city. There's mm. a lot of people like come in, but a lot of people leave for jobs in other cities and that's you know, these days in particular you know, because we have such a long-term clientele here. Yep. People, people come in and stay, you know, if they get through that first, you know, initial few month phase, they're pretty much locked in for a long time. And what tends to be a limiter for people to get into that more long-term phase, Scott? I think it's people that haven't developed, um, or are in the process of trying to learn to develop good habits, you know, whether if working out is a brand new thing and you can only do it, say in the morning classes, right? now, it's like, you know, they, they don't get up enough going enough or they don't make enough of those social connections. Um, but that's one thing we try to do right away. You know, we have a pretty fun class in the morning. That's kind of my group. And, uh, you know, we try to foster those. So pretty soon somebody's like, Hey, where, where were you? You know? And then, if you can get through that phase, but it generally it's, it's, you know, people just didn't get started enough and then they're, you know, when they're not coming in and then they just don't. Yeah. I think like it, it, sometimes it's just like a vacation that kind of like gets people off the rails a little bit. And then they're like, uh, you know, I just didn't want to get that first week of CrossFit back in. And now I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. You know I would mean? say that does happen sometimes. Yeah. People you come a little off, off the wagon or people have or whatever, a kid or they... people get a new job and oh well, mm-hmm. my hours change blah 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 do you do like a client retention program where like um you're calling people if they haven't been there in a few days and that kind of stuff yeah or sending yeah, a we, message yeah we've done hmm. messages or calls we've done that for years does that um, do you find that that's helpful yeah i mean we we uh realize 
a long time ago, I want to say 2011 or 12, we hired a business coach and kind of worked us through a number of things and our retention wasn't, you know, that was our main problem at the time. Of course, that was still during the boom years. We had lots of people coming in new and, and uh, so we looked at ways to do that and we implemented that and a number of other things and, uh, you know, retention uh, definitely improved. I mean, it's held because we've continued to do those things, but we have a, you know, one coach or two coaches assigned to kind of check in on people. And it's generally the people that come at the, their time of day, you know, so that's familiar to them. Uh, so uh, Very yeah, cool. that's definitely helpful. I think we got some golden nuggets in this conversation here, Scotty, uh, amongst the programming and the progressions and retention of clients and that kind of stuff. I think it's a very valuable conversation for us to have. But I just want to wrap yeah. things up a little bit today of just a conversation that I was having with some other coaches over the last few weeks in that nowadays there's so much information out there online, in books, uh, or you can just like, you know, get yourself a coach um, of – uh, uh, in, in per, per, pertaining to the fact that there's tons of programs and things that work and all that kind of stuff. And the role of the coach has, in my mind, changed significantly over the last, let's say, five years. From one in which we are now like the information givers to almost the whittling down and potentiation of the client uh, and, and minimizing stress and all the other factors outside of training. And it's a lot less, you know, CrossFit coaching as it is life coaching. What are your thoughts on that, Scott? Yeah, yep, I would agree. I've noticed uh, a definite evolution of, you know, I've always loved researching all types of methods. And, uh, and I realized at some point, you know, a few last few years, like, well, these are great to know, but the simplistic principles are really all you use with nearly everybody, even those that are fairly advanced. And it's really more about um, going through various life practices and are you ready to do this work? Mm. And, have, and if they are doing the work and if they're not modifying it and, and uh, yeah, it, it's more exactly what you said. It's more reading the person, guiding them, making modifications, um, than it is pure technique or all this advanced programming knowledge or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for me, I think uh, I've, I've always in the past done so much and I've, I've, I've delved so much into the actual training aspect because I think on some level, maybe there was an uncomfortability of telling people like, yo, you work too much, you're too stressed out. You don't eat right. You don't sleep enough. And that's why you suck. You know, it's not, it's not the training program. Like most training pr programs work, right? Yeah. Like think about it. Yeah. Like, you know, progressive overload, um, making sure that, uh, you know, obviously if, if, if uh, in the beginning, especially taking the time to ensure that the movement is quality. Mm -hmm. If you're doing that, pretty much any program from then on out is going to work. Yep. It's, it's more about like, okay, what is going on within the program that's either – hampering them and preventing them from, from making progress or uh, what is within their lifestyle that is preventing the progress. Yeah. That's preventing adaptation to the work. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like you, there should be vigor and inspired work most of the time during training. There mm -hmm. should not be, Oh man, I'm just having to slug through this and I just got to grind through it for another week or two. And I know I'll get to the other side. Like, Maybe if you're like pre-competition and you're in, in the, like in the sport of fitness where you have to go through like, you know, tolerance of lactate, lactate, like that might be it legit. But I would mm -hmm. say for most of the training, it should be something where you're coming back the next day and you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's and, if you're, game and if you're changes. not feeling good, it's not because of the workout. It's because you're not recovering or you're dead on the inside. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, amen. Yeah, I've, having kind of gone through that progression myself and then watch, you know, really knowing what to look for in other people. Yes, and that's the huge, like, such a good point. You have to go through it yourself to then be able to identify it in others. Yep. Yeah, nowadays, you know, I almost always look forward to the train, almost always hungry to train, feel like I almost always have good training sessions or, or rides, you know, and occasionally like we with competition we accept, right? Yep. You know, I'm, I, on this bike competition, I rode more than I wanted to, to the point where I 
you know, I, I knew it was going to happen and it happened, but I got my result I wanted and now I'm resting until I feel like I'm really pumped to do it again. Yeah, that's important. And um, including in that is the, the micro adjustments that one must might, one must make based upon life stressors in that given program, uh, you know, texting your coach or, or messaging your coach in a very uh, regular fashion. Oh, by the way, I didn't sleep last night. What's my programming to, adjusted to today? Oh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I, I got sick. How are we going to re- – like your beautiful 16-week template, take that thing and th- flush it down the toilet. Because mm-hmm. or or hey, I, I tweak my shoulder or now my 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 goal is different. Everything changes, and yeah, that I think is totally becoming, yeah, I think yeah. That is becoming what real coaching is about. Real coaching, yes. Yeah, you know, I'd say you know if you if, you're, if a coach writes out a beautiful sixteen week you know progression training program, and if it's all executed exactly as it's written, I would say that's a poor coach. <laughs> There's no way it should, right? There's no way that the one day here and there wouldn't require some sort of modification, whether it's yeah. taking away or maybe 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 you do more in a few days too, right? If the you know the pot yeah. is hot, so to speak, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it needs to be fluid. That's awesome. Great. I mean, I think this is a good conversation today, Sky. A lot of things that we can stem on, a lot of things that people might be able to find some value in. But uh, you got anything else yeah. for today, Scott? Good one. No, I think that's a, that's a good one. Awesome. Well, I'm Sean LaFlock. You can get me at Sean at CrossFitDelrayBeach.com. I'm Scott Hagnes. You can get me at Scott at CrossFitPortland.com. Scotty, it's awesome talking to you, buddy. I'll talk to you next yeah, week. Yeah, as always. Yes, take care. Later, man.